What's up, everybody? Once again, it's Brand Man Sean. And once again, you can see I have a very special guest for you guys. You really want to make sure you watch this entire thing. This is Wendy Day. She has been. Yay! <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm going to go ahead and toot her horn for her and say that she's um, been a part of brokering some pretty legendary deals, uh, namely um, Cash Money. Um, she's done things for No Limit Records. That's Master P for you young people who don't know um, Eminem. She's managed people like Twister, uh, David Banner, C. Murda, and she's just an all around advocate. Um, for artists, which is something that's really important, right? We see a lot of people these days who are talking about artists getting their money, but she's been doing this since the 90s. So I'm really excited, without further ado, to introduce you to Wendy Day. So let's get it going. What's up, Wendy? How you doing? Brad, that I'm going to match your energy today. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny when people talk about, like, energy and things like that, because I never notice and even think of myself that way. But I, pray, right. I appreciate it. <laughs> I love that about you, though. It's awesome. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. So let's have uh, one quick question, and then we'll roll right into what I want to get right to is cash money. But how did you get into the industry at, um, in the first place? Because you weren't in... Um, I no, I, I came to this as a fan, like in 1980, and, and most of you weren't even born yet. Um, in 1980, I started listening to rap music and I fell in love with the energy and the passion nice. of the music. Okay. Um, I went and got a master's degree in African-American studies because I heard um, a line that Chuck D said and it inspired me to like really delve into black studies. And then um, from there, I went and got an MBA so that I could make money. So I wanted to do something where I could combine my knowledge of the struggle with making money. And, and one of my goals was to help rappers really make money because the artist is always the last one to get paid, as you know. Right. So um, I got into this in 1992 by starting a not-for-profit organization to help artists become more knowledgeable about the music industry, kind of like what you're doing. Right. And also to help pull them out of bad deals or negotiate them into better deals. Mm. Okay. That's how I got started. Man, I mean, that's what's crazy is when you, like just you talked about that part of your story, we talk about the impact that music has the potential to make and a lot of artists try yes. to, like, it doesn't. Um, have that impact or it can't have that impact but i'm living proof you literally just said you got a degree in african-american studies because, because of a of one line a white woman to. got a degree yes. in african-american studies because of a lot and i went and i got my degree from temple which is an afrocentric school really so like i studied under dr malefe asante if you know who that is he wrote the book on afrocentricity okay wow so i have a very i have a very extreme perspective <laughs> 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 I can only imagine. I can only imagine. <laughs> All right. Well, so getting into the industry and your experience there, what was that first move that you made when you got into the industry? Because I mean, you're you're an outsider. How does how do you even what do you do? Yeah, because I'm white, I'm female, and I was from the suburbs. Yeah. And I was trying to uh, immerse myself into black culture in New York City mm. in, you know, in the inner cities. So I spent a lot of time going to events. I didn't really go to clubs because I'm not a club person, yeah. but I spent a lot of time going to events where up and coming artists would hang out in the Bronx and in Brooklyn and on the Lower East Side in Manhattan. So I really spent a lot of time immersing myself into the culture and understanding the artists and what their needs were, what the strengths were, what the weaknesses. Um, and then I started supplying events and tools that they needed in order to build their careers. Like I started um, putting together monthly panel discussions for free. I started at NYU. And then when we grew out of the 
classroom space out of that size, I moved them to ASCAP in New York, which had a bigger, um, like a, um, a bigger, I don't want to say it was a convention room, but it held like 300 people. So wow. I was able to grow to a bigger size. Um, and I did that once a month. And then also once a month, I put together um, cypher sessions and I would go to the bigger producers that I was meeting and asking them to supply um, like an hour long beat tape or a two hour long beat tape so that up and coming rappers could rap over their instrumentals. And they were new beats. They weren't like instrumentals that were already out. So guys like Premier, um, RZA, Easy Mo B, like the producers who were the leading producers at the time were giving music for the up and coming artists to rap to because a lot of these guys would never have the opportunity to rap over those kind of beats unless they were signed to like a major record label. Got you. Got you. That's dope. Um, it was really hard to answer your question directly. It was really hard when I started because I am an outsider. Yeah. So, you know, it, it made it really difficult. A lot of people in the industry thought that I was just there to either take advantage mm -hmm. of artists or to fuck or whatever. Yeah. Can, I, can I swear? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, so they, they thought that I had ulterior motives, but with time came proof that that's not what I was there for. Yeah. I mean, I think one thing that you did say, though, is something that's still true for a lot of people's entryway into the game, especially on the business side, but just events, throwing some sort of events and yes. educating and becoming a part of people's the community first and yeah. then figuring out where you fit in from there. That's still a common thread that. Yes. Plus, I came I came from a position of service like I was really and still am, you know, 28 years later, really trying to help people. Yeah. Like I was, I was finding out what their needs were that weren't being met mm -hmm. and then supplying those needs for free. So mm -hmm. like everything that I did was free. I made sure that the artists didn't have to pay for the knowledge. They didn't have to pay to come and rap at the Cypher sessions. Yeah. And it also brought together unity amongst artists because in New York, New York is made up of five boroughs, right? Plus yep. New Jersey. So it it created an opportunity from artists all over the city. And I did it in Manhattan on 48th Street, which is very like centrally located. And it brought together like all of the underground at that point in time were coming to my events. So they really got to know each other and they got to be comfortable with each, with each other. And they started to network. And, and this wasn't a planned consequence. Mm. It was kind of a happy consequence. So, where they actually got to get comfortable with each other and start to work together. So there was a sense of unity amongst the underground, especially of lyricists mm -hmm. in New York City. And it made it easier for people to work together. Dope. So I want to get into the in-between a little later, but fast forward from there to brokering a deal for cash money three years. Right. $30 million. Yes. Um, I met Cash Money in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. I went, I was down there for um, a music conference and I walked into Peaches, which was like the record store. It would be like walking into Spotify today, right? <laughs> okay. And, and I looked at all the music that they had from underground artists because that was my passion. Mm -hmm. And when I flipped a couple of them over, I noticed the Cash Money logo. And I'm like, oh, who are these guys? So I started to put out feelers. I finally was introduced to them by a street team guy in Houston. And I realized they had put out um, 31 releases over a six year period. They just didn't really work them to go beyond just New Orleans. Mm. So when I met them, that's what I did. I, I extended their fan base, I brought them through the Midwest, through the Mid-South. And when they hit a, a larger area, they just naturally sold more CDs because back then CDs were the, you know, were the litmus test. You know, they were the, they were the Instagram followers, right, right, right. if you will. They were the proof of concept. 
Did you, you do know, so, touring? How did you expand your fan base? Did you just set up tours um, for them originally? Through, through touring, through marketing, through promotion, okay. and just through like like hard groundwork, like going out there and hitting all the different cities and spreading the word and spreading the music. You know, with CDs, it was a little bit easier. Um, and, and I guess we could argue that it was also a little bit harder because it was physical. Right. You know, we could walk up to somebody that looked like they might be a fan of the music and say, hey, do you listen to rap? And if they said yes, we could hand them a CD. And most people would either pop it into their Walkman or pop it into their car and they would listen right then and there. And if they liked it, you know, it was like, score! If they didn't like it and they threw it on the ground, we would just pick it back up and give it to the next person. Nice. <laughs> I love the fact that y'all just pretty much just waited to see if you're going to waste the money or not. Let's recycle this. Okay. Let's recycle this all the time. Now, how did you... Can you give me a little bit more insight onto how they were moving? Because everything I've heard about them has pretty much been like they were moving like they had a lot going on before they got signed. Like they, they, they were, did. yeah, they had a lot of money moving from various they places. They had a lot of power and influence. They just, us getting signed just unlocked what they already had going on. It, it did. Um, it, it was like a, it was like a turbo boost. You know yeah. what I mean? Or, or steroid. Yeah. It intensified the work ethic that they already had. I mean, they had the artists already signed to the label. And like I said, they had put out 31 projects over a six year period, okay. you know, so they were pretty well entrenched in the music industry. They were pretty solid doing what they were doing. Hmm. So when you got to the point you were broken or a deal, like what made, what made, well, who, who, who made that decision? What made you guys to even decide to go into this? Well, I, I went to them under the guise of let's, let's do a deal. So I put like the day I met them, I put together a business plan for them and started shopping a deal. But the major labels didn't really understand Southern rap at that point in time. Like for example, our first offer was penalty records for just juvenile for 75,000. And I knew that their value was so much higher than that because they had already made way more than $75,000. Like every time they put out a CD, they were selling it, you know, somewhere between 5,000 and 25,000. So at $10 a CD, you can kind of figure the math, yeah. you know, you can see what kind of money they were making. So it would have been a pay cut to, for them to take less money. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so now knowing that you actually approached them with let's get a deal, like that whole thing, and you had to plan, what did that overall strategy look like? You said, if you look at an artist, you say, all right, I know these guys, they're moving, they have something. Now I just need to get them to a point where they can sign a deal. Um, exactly. Well, what they, what they had was local. It was New Orleans, a little bit of Houston, mm -hmm. sort of like that I-10 interstate. Mm -hmm. um, that's really where it had spread. And because I had been working with Twista in the Midwest and with Eminem at that point in time, I knew that I had the relationships to bring them into the Midwest and into the Mid-South, areas like Memphis, Tennessee, um, Chicago, Illinois, Detroit, Cleveland. Like I knew, I knew that their sound would expand it wasn't just a regional sound. So when I realized that the deals weren't conducive to the guy signing yet, that's when we took them into a larger regional area. Like for example, um, the lawyer that was my lawyer at the time, which was also their lawyer, was also the lawyer for Three Six Mafia. So he was able to um, uh, unite them with Three Six so that cash money open for a bunch of their shows in the Mid-South area. So oh. they were able to spread just from, you know, opening for shows. And I, I don't want people to think that you could just open for somebody and get a, a fucking record deal. It doesn't work that way, mm -hmm. right? Like there was so much more going on than just that. That was just one aspect of what we were doing. We were also doing, you know, groundwork in all the areas where they were, where they were performing. Mm -hmm. You know, we were building the buzz at the street level and the club level. Back then we weren't going for radio because um, 
guys like Cash Money couldn't get on the radio. It just wasn't realistic at that point in time. This is, you know, 1997 and 98. So things were much different than they are now. But the, the principles that we were using were the same that you use today to get a deal. And that's build a buzz, prove to the label if, you're, if your goal is to get a deal, right? Which I could argue with you why that shouldn't be the goal. But let's just say the goal is to get a deal. If you can build a buzz and show a label that you've got a fan base in place and you're making money, it reduces their risk and makes them not only want to sign you, but it sets the tone of the financial parameters of your deal. If you're already out here making $1.5 million on your own, the deal from a major label is going to have to start around $3 million. Mm. So by... I call that getting leverage, right? If you're building your fan base and you're showing them that the risk is reduced, that's leverage. So when you go into the deal, you're going to be able to get a far better deal than somebody that just has great music and, you know, 30,000 followers on Instagram. So today, if I have an artist, right, and it's the exact same scenario, right? I, these guys are moving. It's a group or it's just an artist. They have something going and I'm maybe a manager, right? And I'm coming in, how would, what would I say I would need to do in steps wise to build that buzz or get them to the standpoint, they actually sign, they can sign a deal that has a decent amount of leverage. Exactly. Okay. Everybody that's watching this is going to hate this answer because the first thing you really need is a budget. And for some reason, artists are allergic to finding money. I don't know why that is, but <laughs> the best thing that a manager could do or an artist himself or herself could do is find somebody that believes in them and is willing to invest in them for a fair rate of return. Meaning if you can find an investor that's either going to lend you the money to market and promote, or they're going to want to own a percentage of your company that's small enough that it makes it worthwhile, then you can utilize that funding to blow up not only on the internet, but in the real world. Um, what, what, what my clients do is we work like, I call it a five hour dri driving radius. It's usually like a three to four state area, yep. but it's an area where they can easily access and drive to different cities and towns in the area and market and promote their music. And we do it old school and we do it new school. You know, we get out there and shake hands and kiss babies and take pictures. And we also do digital marketing where, you know, we're, we're advertising, we're doing Facebook ads, we're doing Google ads, we're boosting the followers on Instagram through engagement. I mean, real followers. I don't mean, you know, this bullshit, get a million followers for 1999. I mean, the real engaging with potential fans mm -hmm. and, and putting out music that's amazing and creating great visuals and videos for the songs that make people want to share your music with their friends mm. you know and and that's that's always the goal you know if you start with a great budget and you start with music that's marketable there's no reason why you can't do this yourself and the great thing is that as you do this and you realize that you're you're developing a fan base and you start to get paid for shows you know you start making a thousand dollars fifteen hundred twenty five hundred your music starting to grow in that in that in that regional area that we just talked about, you may find that you don't even need a label. You may be able to do this on yourself, like Chance the Rapper, you know, like Frank Ocean, like um, Little Donald, like the folks that are out here doing this now independently yeah. that realize that they don't need a record label. So oh, I, I think that part about the five hour radius, that thing is strong. I'm, I'm, I've heard people use six hours, but I'm, a lot of artists, especially in this internet age, they get followings that are across the world, right? And then there's right. no to double down and, and create an intimate fan base relationship because you, right. can't, you don't have the money. And I see a lot right. of people finding, um, doing that. Um, with, with you um, and the artists that you work with in that five hour radius, you said you guys do old school and new school. What is old? Yeah, we hang posters. Yeah. We, hang, we hang posters. We give out postcards that have all the links. Mm -hmm. um, they'll have the Spotify code, the QR code. We give out business cards that have all of the different platforms. You know, one of my philosophies is I don't want to force 
a potential new fan to come to me. I want to meet them where they go. So if they prefer SoundCloud, I want my music on SoundCloud. If they prefer Instagram, yeah. I want my shit on Instagram. If they're a Facebook person, I want my shit on Facebook. So we make sure that we go to all the platforms. To me, they're like cities. You know, I make sure that we're everywhere that the fans are. And then once the fan base gets big enough, like once you become Drake, you can define where your people should come to find you. But, yep. but until you're that large, you've got to go where they're comfortable being and where they're hanging out. Because somebody that's really comfortable with Facebook is not going to come to SoundCloud. They're not going to come to YouTube. You yep. know, I'm, I'm an Instagram YouTube person, right? That's, that's my, that's where I live. So I can count on this hand how many times I've been to Facebook. I hate Facebook. So if you're trying to get my attention and you're sending me stuff on Facebook, I'll never even know that you're alive. You know, oh, yeah. I've, and, I've and that's me as a fan, you know, <laughs> yeah. so if you're an, if you're an artist and you want to reach your fans, you've really got to go to them. You know, you've got to humble yourself. You've got to change your attitude where you're so dope that people should come find you and you've got to go find them and you've got to, you've got to share your music with them without spamming them. Like you can't just at somebody on their Instagram and expect them to go check out your music because there's just mm -hmm. too much music out here. Yep. But if you have um, a freestyle that's so amazing or if you have a song that is really spreadable or you've got a video that's just a great video, people are going to share that with each other and they're going to and they're going to go in and become like your best resource. They're going to become your brand ambassador, if you will. Brand man! <laughs> I, I think that's really cool because in marketing in general, which artists don't realize, you have to create as little friction as possible, right? It's, it's, over, it's easier to overcome certain barriers when you're like on a one-on-one -on -one sales basis, but your stuff yes. is out there. And when the shit's just out there like that and there's these barriers, oh, I need to go over to this website or I need to go over this website or I need to click this link, you're, ma you're, you're making the decision harder and harder. Um, like you said, I mean, I've had people who have messaged me on Facebook and, you know, I wouldn't find out until maybe half a year later, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, exactly. You know, and I'll exactly. I happen to be on Facebook and I'm not going to, and I'm still not going to go click on my inbox and read through it, but I just say, Oh man, I didn't know people were messaging me on, on Facebook. Cause I'm just not there. That's not my preferred. Platform, exactly. Right. So you exactly idle when, and, and how you market, you have to, like you said, you have to put you all have the, to be where the people are, build the relationship. And then when you, yeah. you know, build that trust, you, deposit your work then they'll you know come back to you if they like you um there's something that i don't want to pass over because i haven't really heard anybody talk about this much you said the investor relationship right yes. and then investor relationship you talked about two things you said you can either have them be a part of your company or they and just invest or, or right right they're an angel mm -hmm. right. they lend yes which one would you say is probably i know it can be subjective but if, it's, if you it's, know. yeah it's different it's different for everybody you know um i guess see if you if you borrow the money then you have debt so mm -hmm. you've got to pay somebody back and you've got to set the terms of when you're going to pay them back before you take the money yep. and you know like when I was working with Trouble, it took us two and a half years to get him to explode again, you know, in the Southeast. Mm. Um, with Donald, it took six months. So just to give you like the extremes, right? So if I had, if I had counseled Trouble to take out a loan to work him and he had to pay it back in a year, we would have been fucked. Because it took us longer than that to really, to really get him bubbling. Gotcha. You know, with, with Donald, it was opposite. Donald's partner is, is an investor. It is a, um, an angel investor. You okay. know, he has no ownership. So paying him back is going to be a breeze, you know, when, that, when it comes due. Nice. So it's, it's very hard to predict. Also, you got you to gotta understand that what the investor wants is kind of dictates this too, right? Like we can sit here and talk all day about the kind of investor you want, but if you go out there and you find that the reality is that the people that are willing to give you money 
want 50% ownership of your project or even of your company, you know, that's a decision you have to make individually. Like, is that too much? Is that just enough? Is that too little? Right. You know, you don't get what's fair. You get what you negotiate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Speak, speaking of that, obviously you've had such an integral role in negotiating contracts. How does, how do you get into that in the first place? Like having that? I, I, I got into it because I had seen so many bad contracts. Like I had seen so many, so much fuckery on paper <laughs> that I started to recognize what wasn't good for artists. Mm -hmm. So I was able to sit in meetings with labels and ask for the opposite of things, of areas where I saw artists getting screwed. Um, that's how I got into negotiating contracts. Right. Um, how would somebody do this that want, you know, just woke up today and says, I want to be in the music industry? The best thing you could do is take some, some law classes mm -hmm. so that you can understand you know, what's fair and acceptable in a contract. Yeah. And then start talking to artists, find out, you know, um, and, and it's not always easy to get to establish artists, but maybe you get to them by doing um, interviews with them so that you can then start to ask them the really in-depth questions like, okay, what in your contract have you stumbled upon that wasn't to your advantage? Oh, you know, well, in my contract, it says that um, they have to recoup 100% before I see any money. So I've been broke for a year and a half. Okay, well, then that tells you that in the contract that you negotiate, you want to make sure that you get your artist some of the money, like maybe only 80% of the money is getting recouped from so that the money is so that 20% is feeding through to the artist. You know, I don't, I don't know that that's the solution because every situation is different, but that would be, that to me would be the obvious way to learn how to negotiate by finding out weak spots in other people's deals. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Like just learning and hearing those small. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, yes. I, I learn a lot of things just by talking to people myself. <laughs> so me I, too. I just, That's how I learned. You just hear something and then they'll be complaining. And now you know, ooh, I don't want to do and that. And now you learn. Yeah. <laughs> and you learned who not to fuck with. <laughs> right. Exactly. Because when they complain, they complained about something right. or someone. So right. you know to keep a little distance. Yeah, I think that's just, it should be life in general, right? <laughs> One would think. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, like, so what about people that are so notable, right? Is it because you worked with these people from ground up? Because yes, remember you, I mean, everybody. All the way up to, you know, the cash money, Eminem, and all these people. Those are some day one. oracle names. Well, maybe not day one. Maybe like day, maybe like day fifty. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, from 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 the beginning. I mean, they had to be doing something to catch my eye. Mm. So it's not like they started rapping on Wednesday and I called them on Friday. Right. But you know, let's say that it takes the average person three years to build a career. Mm -hmm. I've usually found them around the first year, maybe a year and a half. Because mm. I, I really, I really travel at the ground level, mm. like the underground level. Got For you. me, like, I love that artists get really successful. I love how big Eminem is. I love how big Drake is. I love, you know, the, that these guys are, are, you know, almost at a billionaire status. But that's not interesting to me. Yeah. The level that's interesting to me is not when brands are calling the art artists to do things, but when we have to figure out, okay, how do we get Red Bull to support this artist? Or how do we get Samsung to give this artist 20 grand so that they can travel around that little four or five state area? Like that's more, that's more interesting to me is that ground up level, mm. you know? Yeah, it definitely makes sense. So I'm thinking, all right, you come in in year one, because it's really interesting to me to hear that you, it's not like you're an A&R or something, but you keep your, your ear to the ground. And then you Very see so. situations where selectively you'll say, hey, I want to work with this artist. 
right? Or, or well, you... it's a little it's a little deeper than that. Like I I don't want you to think that I'm making a decision based on just the music. I'm not. Um, they need to have an investor in place. Like there has to be money for right. me to be able to market and promote them. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. Um, also, I don't work for free anymore. I'm 20 eight years in the music, 27 years in the music industry. I'm yeah. not free. I'm very, very expensive. Yeah. You know, cause my track record speaks for itself. And then the artist also has to have a level of grind and a level of willingness to do what it takes to succeed. Mm -hmm. And most artists don't. We all know artists that are incredibly fucking gifted, mm -hmm. but they just want to sit around and play PlayStation all day or they just want to smoke weed all day, or they want to hang out with their boys. Yeah. You know, if, if you're not out there doing something for your career every day, you're not going to be successful because, you know, other artists are going to outwork you. Shit, I'm going to outwork you. <laughs> I, see, that's, that's really dope because I think it's cool to hear you clarify that they're, you, they need to have all their facets of business together. Yes, um, yes. But really, what I when I when you when I heard you talk about finding certain artists that fit, you know, your skill set, where you say, "Hey, I can do something with it," it kind of made me think about Steve Stout saying that he like went into the hood to find Nas, right? I mean, I'm sure that was like there's <clears throat> it's, it's just interesting the people who are like trying to find all types of business, or ah, I just want to work with somebody, and they're not being selective versus hearing people that actually are selective in who they decide to work with. And from what I, I see- I have, to be, I have to be selective. I have to be selective for two reasons. One is I charge a lot of money. So if I take money from somebody and I don't deliver, my reputation is going to be gone. So I could destroy 27 years of brand building mm. by fucking one artist, mm. right? So I'm very careful that I make sure I work with people where I can deliver. And then the second thing is that I've banged my head for many, many years. I've, I've tried to do this for free. I've tried to do this for cheap. I've tried to do this for next to nothing. And I've learned from failing because I can't do this for free or for, for cheap. So I need to have the money to do the minimal level of marketing and promotion. And there needs to be some proof that there's a tiny little fan base that likes the music. So mm -hmm. if you've got great music, but you've got no one paying attention to you, I would have a hard time working with you because there's no proof that you're going to be able to build a fan base. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to destroy my reputation on a treadmill, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I want to be able to keep moving forward and keep building and keep growing. You know, I'm in the process of building an incubator. So my brand really matters to me. Mm. You know, the money is secondary. The money's going to come. But if, if I'm able to build success and do what I love, that's what builds my brand. Got you. Dope. Brand what, man. What's, brand <laughs> man. <laughs> well, what type of incubator? I hadn't heard that. What type, type of incubator are you trying to build? Um, I'm trying to build um, a, a company for artists that have money, but they don't have enough money. Like it really takes about $150,000 to do this properly. That's mm. like the starting level, right? Mm. But there's artists out here that have 50,000 or 75,000, or they have found an investor that's willing to put up some of the money, but they don't have all of the money. So I'm trying to help that niche market, like the guys because what's happening out here now is guys that have some money are giving it to people that can't deliver. So they're losing their 50 grand or they're losing their 75. And because they don't have enough money to do this properly, like I can't help them. So I feel like there's a middle level of artists out here that have the ability to succeed. They just don't have a hundred percent of what they need. So I'm trying to build um, a, a company that will like a safe space for them that will support them and teach them and encourage them and show them how to do this properly for their limited funds. Meaning the incubator is going to supplement the money and, and give them what they need to succeed. And we're going to do it without taking ownership, which is fucking amazing. 
because yeah. most people, when they give you money, they want to take half of your company. We're not going to do that. <laughs> so, so and you, don't call me about it because it's not set up yet. I it. figure around second quarter, second quarter 2019, it should be up and running. Nice, nice. Yeah. More digital or physical space? Or both? Um, both, both. Nice, cool. Yeah, everything I do now is digital and physical. Cool. All right. Yeah, I have clients like all over the country, not all over the world, just the U.S. <laughs> I haven't quite gotten the relationships that I need to succeed offshore yet. Okay. So that's just domestically. Cool. So I hear a question a lot, actually, from artists that have 30000 or $50,000, right? What are some general things that you would say as far as spending that budget? If, if I only had 30 or 50 and understand that's not enough money to succeed, it's not enough money to build enough of a buzz to monetize your fan base. And for me, you making money as a rapper matters so much more than you just being like famous in your hood. Mm -hmm. I, I really want artists to be able to live off of the money they make from rapping. So because I know it's not enough money, my best suggestion of where to spend that money is either to make investments that are going to legally increase that money. So real estate is a great place. Doing shows is a great, a great way to increase your money. If you're not willing to do that, I would spend that money um, instead of doing that five hour driving radius that I was talking about, I might just do two cities and the internet. You know, I would definitely have a digital campaign because digital really, really, really fucking matters, mm -hmm. you know? So I would just maybe do a one state area or a two state area. But my focus would be not just building fans. It would be trying to find an investor. I would take some of that money and I would put it into um, assembling a business plan. And I would start attending different events that attract people that have money. Mm -hmm. um, the most basic one that I can think of off the top of my head is Chamber of Commerce. Chamber of Commerce meetings yeah. are people that own businesses in the community. They are people that have money. You know, the Rotary Club, they are people that have money and want to better the community. So there are places you can go and become part of that community. You know, I'm, I, I invest in real estate personally. So I go to real estate investment meetings all the time. And these are people that have money. The money's from real estate, but these are people that make money and have money to invest. You know, so you, you'd be the only rapper at a real estate investor meeting if you yeah. came there, you know, you can't just come and be greedy and be like, yo, give me money. You got to sort of invest in the community and with time and become part of that community and let people get to know you, you know, maybe come to all the meetings for a year while you're still building your career and working on building who you are. But as people get to know you and they see your hustle, you're more likely to attract an investor than if you're sitting home playing PlayStation and, you know, sending out Facebook posts saying, yo, I'm looking for somebody to give me 150 grand. Mm -hmm. Like that's not a productive way to find money. Letting people get to know who you are and building a relationship is a very productive way to raise money. Got you. I think when something super important about what you said is just, just the fact that you have to build a relationship with those investors. Like, I don't care what your In buzz anything. is. Like what you're moving, you can't just say, oh, I got even 50,000 fans and I just had this many streams and approach of an investor. Uh, you have, right. to, they have to trust you because you're giving you money. When they give you your money, they don't yes. know what to do with that money. Like <laughs> no one's coming yes. to $50,000 and not knowing if you even as a person move correctly, if you're going to be in jail tomorrow, if you are going to scam them out. Are you going to return phone calls? Are right. you going to get off your couch and do what you need to do with that, that money? Or are you just going to buy chains and smoke weed? Exactly. So, you know, that part is very important. That's a long game, but you have to keep yes. moving and moving, like, you know, keep doing what you do as a rapper. But as you said, start to move in different communities. And you talked about real estate, which is interesting because I find today, like being a rapper is like the new restaurant in terms of uh, <laughs> it's the new dope game. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like for an investors, they're like, oh, you know, I might have a restaurant or I have this cool, like, oh no, I have a rapper now. Right. You know, everybody, right. everybody has a rapper. It's becoming really popular to invest in rappers. So it's probably easier than ever 
to make money off of it because it's just accessible in so many different ways. Yes, it's the it's the easiest I've seen it to get money. Like when I was coming up, you almost had to sign to a label to get money. Mm. You know, they were the gatekeepers. You couldn't do this independently. Right. And today you can do this yourself, you know? And it's the easiest I've ever seen. Not to say that it's easy to find money, right. but it's the easiest I've ever seen mm -hmm. it to find money. And I'll say this, it's easier to find an investor than it is to find a record deal. 100%. Far easier. Far, <laughs> far, far easier. 100%. Now, my question to you then, from your perspective, what's the advantage from having an investor I love that question. and an advantage for having a record label? I love that question. Um, for me, the number one thing is Oh, I'm losing you. Are you there? Sorry. Yeah. Can you, right. Are you there? Yeah. I was okay. going to say, no, I wish um, before she drops the gym. <laughs> I know, right? The secret to life is. <laughs> 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 um, but the, <laughs> sorry. The, the, the difference is that ownership, the ownership is the number one most important thing. Because with the ownership, that means you're going to make the lion's share of the money and you're going to have the control. If you sign to a record label, they're going to dictate where you go and what you do. Mm. And you're going to make about 12 to 15. Uh-oh. 12 to 15 percent. Sorry about that. You're yeah. going to make 12 to 15 percent of the income, right? After you pay back that money. That's if you sign to a label. But independently, you're going to have 100 percent ownership of what you're doing. So you're going to be able to collect 100% of the money. You're going to give some to your distributor. Your distributor is going to get somewhere between 5% and 20% mm -hmm. in order to distribute you. But you're going to own 100% of your publishing. You're going to own 100% of your masters. And that's the control and the decision making that comes behind the music. So if a label, for example, who owns the masters and probably part of your publishing, if a corporation comes along, um, let's say Donald Trump, Donald Trump comes along and wants to license one of your songs for his rally, the <laughs> label gets to say yes or no. You know, uh, if, okay. if, there's, if there's gay porn that wants to use your song as part of the soundtrack, the label could say yes to that. I doubt a label's going to say yes because they don't want to piss off the artist. But right. still, if you own the masters, and you own the publishing, you get to say yes or no. Right. And that's really the power in the music. Interesting. So what about, what would you say the advantages are left today in terms of having a label versus an investor? The advantages for a label is that they have the know-how. They've been doing this for a long time. They're a giant machine. The difference is sort of like a major label is a cruise ship and an independent label is a jet ski. If you're on a lake and you want to move around, a jet ski is the perfect choice because you can move around really quick. If you start to go down a road and a road right on the ocean, I mean, on the, on a lake, if you're going down, the, if you're going down a, a path in the water and you see that it's, it's got rocks and stuff, you can make a U-turn really quickly. Mm -hmm. A major label is like a cruise ship. You're going to take a cruise ship to go across the ocean. You're going to take a cruise ship if the water's really murky and you can't cross it easily in, on a jet ski. But a cruise ship can't turn quickly. It can only go forward or turn very widely and very slowly. It's got a really wide berth. Right. So the difference between the two is with an indie label, you can make quick and easy decisions. With a major label, you can't. There's a plan in place and you can't veer from that plan. Even if things go horribly wrong, it's very <clears throat> hard to stop dropping one song and turn around and drop another one. You right. kind of have to just go down that path. Mm. See, so when you say that, I think that's beautiful because it makes me think about startups, right? More just in a strictly business sense. And that's how, you know, when you think label, it's like startup versus corporate, right? Indie label versus corporate. And a startup, like a legit startup is truly in an experimentation phase. So an artist early on is like that, and if you sign too early where you really are learning so much about what's going to be right for you and before you actually have a true defined path that you know all right we want to drop a bomb in this direction and drop a lot of resources it doesn't even make sense 
in most cases, like outside of, you know, money or, you know, just wanting to be on a label, all these other things, but you don't even never right. necessarily know what the best product is yet. So right. you're, you're over, you could over invest in the wrong thing. I guess Absolutely. That's- Absolutely. Yeah. And then there's also artists that just want to be artists, you know, yeah. when, when I was working with trouble, um, Interscope made an offer and he wanted to sign to Interscope. Like mm-hmm. he saw the value in being signed to a major label. Mm-hmm. If that were my decision, I would have never done that mm-hmm. because he was making too much money on his own to actually join a major label and sit in a row of people waiting to come out. You know, we could drop every four months. I think with him, we dropped every four or five months. You know, it's hard to do that on Interscope. Could you not find like a CEO as an artist? Um, you mean, could you, could you find a CEO? Like, would you do that as an artist? I would. Would you recommend that? Yeah. That like, instead yeah. of, if you don't, if you still, hey, I'd yeah. much rather. Yeah. Get a CEO and they handle all that. Yeah. Stuff, right. Yeah. Because uh, you're making a hundred percent of the money instead of, you know, like I said, uh, um, the average record deal is 12 to 15%. Even if you've got a track record of success, like Supreme Leverage, you know, you're still looking at somewhere between 18% and 21% to sign mm-hmm. to a label. Yeah. You know, I've seen deals that are 50, 50, and that may make sense for some people. But for me, because I have the access and I have the knowledge and the relationships, it just makes sense to keep everything a hundred percent. And if the artist has me, I just don't see why, like I hire all the same people the labels do, you know? <laughs> Yeah. And they're far cheaper to hire as an independent than to hire as a major label. But then on the flip side, I don't know if I could build somebody as large as Drake. Like to become Drake, you might need a major label. I don't know. I haven't done that yet. So I can't speak on that. Got you. What inspires you to do YouTube? To get the knowledge out here. Um, you know, I, I got to give props to Jordan Tower because he's actually the one that Called, like I had been thinking about it, talking about it, thinking about it, talking about it. You know how you like you do in life. You have all these plans and you never make time for them. And Jordan Tower called me one day and said, why the fuck aren't you doing this? And I'm like, I don't know. You know, I didn't really have a good answer for him. So he said, come over tomorrow, bring your laptop, get this camera, get this, get this um, uh, microphone and be at my house at noon. We're going to set up your YouTube channel. And I did. And he did. <laughs> and he set it up for me. You know, he did the, the background artwork. Like, he really made it easy for me. He showed me how to record. Um, he showed me how to edit. Although, if you've seen my videos, you know I don't edit. Um, but he, he basically showed me how to do it. The reason that I wanted to do it, once he made it easy for me, was because I find that there's so much misinformation out here. There's so many people that haven't, really achieve success in the music industry yet that are teaching artists how to monetize their music and they haven't done it and it's one thing if like yourself you've taken the time to learn and you've interviewed people and you've you've become a conduit of knowledge but there's so many people out here that haven't like there's guys that have failed careers as a rapper that have never made more than you know, five grand teaching artists how to become superstars. And that scares the fuck out of me. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it would be like, I, I know shit all about basketball. It would be like me getting on YouTube and teaching a guy how to have a career in basketball or how to be a, a cardio surgeon. You know, here's how you operate on a heart. Like, dude, if you have a heart attack, do not call me. You do not want me to come and repair your heart because I'm not good at that, you know? Yeah but I am good at monetizing music and I am good at building brands and building buzzes for artists. So I just wanted to share knowledge from my point of view. And I don't know everything. Mm -hmm. I'm not always right. You know, and you'll see that if you watch my videos, I tell people all the time, like go do the research. Like don't, don't use me as law. Use me as a catapult to get to the next level as as inspiration to go and study this more 
you know, I don't know everything exactly. there is about SoundCloud. I don't want exactly. to. So if you're <laughs> taking advice from me on how to build your SoundCloud page, you're fucked. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but I do know who to go hire to do that. I do know who's legitimate. I do know, you know, where to turn to read books on, on SoundCloud. I do know, you know, what to do to get the knowledge and get the information. Right, right, right. I think that's really important because people don't realize, especially in like the music business, there's no set structure. Like there's, there's structures in place, but there's no true one path to success. And I know really, there's many. Right. There's so many. And I really try to say, especially when it comes to marketing, that overall, what I'm trying to do is present things for you, like frameworks of thinking. So whenever you encounter a situation, you have an additional way to think about it. Because there's no exactly. one path I can tell you this is going to work. But if I can give you different ways of analyzing a situation, when you're in your particular situation, you can say, You're going to make it work. Yeah. Does this thing he said, no, nah, this doesn't make sense right. this time. But this other thing, right. That's what I want people to do. I'm not really, that's why I try to find people like you who are super valuable. Once again, I appreciate what you do as a whole. I'm so happy to do this. And the reality is like most artists out there can't afford to hire me, but yeah. that doesn't mean that they shouldn't have access to the knowledge and the information. Mm. And that's really what keeps me going. Um, you know, I'm going to start doing my videos. I, I took a year off from the videos because I found that people were asking me the same questions over and over and over and over as I'm sure, you know, like oh, they'll watch a video about how to get a record deal and then they'll email me, how do I get a record deal? Mm -hmm. And it's like, are you serious? Um, so I took a year off just to kind of like, you know, first of all, to make money for myself and to sort of like regroup and figure out, okay, what other topics can I delve into that mm -hmm. are really important? So I've been making a list over the past few months of what people want to know and i've done the research on who to go to to get that knowledge if it's something that i don't know you know a lot about if i don't know it intimately um i've also discovered in this industry that there's a lot of fuckery that goes on in this industry mm -hmm. there's a lot of sharks and snakes and people that say they can deliver but can't deliver and i don't know whether they do that purposely to hit a lick or whether they're doing that because they're inept, I don't know. But the okay. bottom line is there's a lot of people out here that are taking money from other people and not delivering. Mm -hmm. And as part of what I do, I really want to highlight the people that are out here doing right by others. You know, the people that deliver a service for what they're getting paid for. Right. So there's a lot of people that I want to interview, but I'm kind of afraid to because I don't ever want to co-sign somebody that's out here just fucking people left and right, you know? So I've also taken this year to get to know a lot of the other players that aren't on my team and people that, that I don't hire, but are worthy of being hired, mm -hmm. you know? And that research alone has been time consuming. I can imagine. I, a, lot crazy. Of people, a lot of people wouldn't put energy into doing that. Like, but that's value. Because, but you, but that, you got to. This whole you know conversation, what I, mean? you got to. I really see how much you value your brand and you understand the loan. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> As everybody should. Like, yeah. the money comes and goes. Yeah. The brand does not. Once you fuck your brand, hmm. you know. <laughs> Take heed to that, people. Take heed to that. <laughs> well, it's been great. I don't want to keep you for too much longer. So, uh, you guys, you can follow Wendy Day. You need to follow Wendy Day um, on YouTube. She has her Instagram at Rap Coalition, but you need to follow exactly. her on YouTube um, because she's always dropping knowledge. Um, it's just so, it's just her perspective is value, obviously valuable. Obviously, you can see that she's had a lot of experience. Um, is there anything that you would like them to know, like a last word? Um, probably I, I'd like them to know that my YouTube channel is youtube.com slash this is Wendy day. And the reason, the reason I'm promoting it is because I don't normally like it's, it's, you would have to Google Wendy day YouTube channel to find me. It would be very hard for you to go to my Instagram mm -hmm. and watch my feed and say, Oh, well, she'll talk about it. Eventually I won't, mm -hmm. I'm not big on self promotion. Wow. I just, that's not what I use my Instagram page for. I don't promote on Instagram. My Instagram page is more about dropping knowledge and like sharing who I am with 
my circle of friends, you know, so that people see, you know, what me and my husband, Tony are doing, you know, what I'm doing with my dog gangster, you know, it's, it's more of the awesome. personal side of okay. me as well as the business side. Right. You know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't get real promotion -y with it. Got it. Awesome. Well, you heard it from her youtube.com slash this is windy day i'll put that in the um, description below i love that i really love what you're doing thank you for doing this oh, i man. know that you don't make money doing this because i don't make money doing this <laughs> you know what i mean you're doing yeah. this because you love it yeah and i i love what you're doing like when you reached out and said i could i interview you um i think i said yes within three seconds like i hit you back so fast i was like fuck yes like oh. whatever i can do to help you let me know because i i would love to so I really appreciate that. I really appreciate, I appreciate you. <laughs> Thanks for doing this. Awesome. Hey, well, once again, everybody, hey, as always, make any comments, what you think is interesting. Just share all that stuff in the comments below. Other than that, if you like this video, go ahead, hit that like button. If you like it, you might as well share it. And if you're not, subscribe. You know what Subscribe, to do. for real. Hit that little bell. And don't forget to troll, because we all fucking love that. <laughs> hit that subscribe button.